I'm Elizabeth Knox. I am the coordinator of our undergraduate advising program in molecular and cellular biology. We're very glad to have all of you here today. Um, we've got some exciting information to share with you from some of our alumni. We've got four uh, alumni who are working in medicine or in dentistry, and they're going to share with you about their career paths. They were all probably sitting maybe not in these exact seats, but sitting in these seats in this room at, or in this building at one time taking organic chemistry or something. I don't know if we're bringing back good or bad memories for all of you. Like <laughs> um, but they have agreed to come and, and share their expertise with us. The other thing that these guys have uh, agreed to do is to be mentors to some of you. And so um, if you applied for the mentorship, you will be receiving an email sometime within the next couple of weeks from either me or Jennifer Brandyberry. We'll be asking you to come in and look at a list of people and we're going to try to match you up with someone who's in your area of interest okay so not only have they agreed to to give us their time tonight to share with you but they're also going to at least for some of you um, kind of mentor you through your last year or two years of school so that you make sure that you are doing the right things and getting in touch with the right people. So we thank them very much. This is uh, Dr. Rich Berkowitz. Rich has been doing this with us for four years now. Started off as a solo mission. Um, he has been very dedicated to mentoring our students. And every year we've added some more people to the panel. Uh, we've added a dentist this year. And next year we may be adding some pharmacists. So we're trying to really grow our MCB mentorship program in the, in the health careers. I'm going to let each of the panelists sort of tell, the, tell their story to you, where they're at now and where they started. And I know Rich had a few words that he wanted to say before we began. It's been a, uh, it's a slow process. It's sort of like a very small snowball that's getting momentum and energy and getting bigger and bigger. As we, and we've really grown this year to the point where we have almost, uh, we can accommodate, we think, close to uh, 35 people, 36 people, which the first year we were only able to take on three. And two of those people are going to be here later, but two of those people that I picked up in the first year are now graduating and both of them are headed to uh, medical school. So it's really been sort of fun to watch people grow and um, achieve their goals. And that's what we want all of you to do, is to achieve your goals. And our goal here tonight is to get advice from people who have lived this, OK? And because sometimes you get advice from all different areas. And sometimes you get wrong advice. And so what we want to do is try to give you the most correct advice that you can get and, your, and so you can achieve your goal and achieve your mission. Um, and so I'd like to thank Dr. Jones and Dr. Martin and Dr. Rosencrast for agreeing to be here tonight and helping us with our, uh, with our program. Our next speaker is Dr. Greg Martin. He is a dentist in the Champaign area. And um, this is the first year we've been able to have a dentist come and speak. And I want to thank him very much for being here. Okay. Um, thank you for having me this evening. I met, there's two or three pre-dent students right over here. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background about myself, the process it took me to get to dental school and through dental school and everything else. So it was ba basically my path. What were my interests? What drove me to do what I did? So basically a little bit about myself. I grew up in Champaign. Um, I'm a longtime resident. I went to high school here. Um, I attended the University of Illinois in biology. I graduated in 1983. I went to the University of Illinois at Chicago for dental school and graduated in 1988. So I'm pretty orange and blue. And that goes to say that um, my children are as well. Um, I've been married for about 27 years. I have four sons. I have my oldest son graduated about two years ago in mechanical, mechanical engineering. My second son's a senior now in the ME here in uh, mechanical engineering. My third son is a freshman at U of I here in mechanical engineering. <laughs> And then my fourth son, he's 17, he's a junior in high school, and actually he's thinking about biology or marine biology, so maybe there's hope for him. <laughs> so um, the engineer, I, I don't know where the engineering came from other than the fact that dentistry is a very technical-driven science, and I can understand where they're getting it, parts of it. So um, that's kind of my home life. Um, uh, my, my practice is in Champaign. It's... Um, it's a general practice. I see all ages. I see um, young individuals. I see teenagers. I see parents. I see grandparents. I see. I like the the um, mixture of patient base that I have. I just don't want to be cubbyholed into one little group of people. I like to mix up my day, and that's why I'm in, in a general practice. Um, my practice. 
I think is a very caring place. We're very personal with our patients. We go out of our way to get to know them. Um, one thing about dentistry, you have the opportunity to meet your patients at least twice a year. They usually come on a recall. A lot of times, um, like I'm going to use Jennifer for example, she is a patient of mine and she has sons and as a result I know her sons, they come in and who brings them? Mom. So I see Jennifer frequently. Um, Champaign-Urbana is a great community. Um, it's not a large community, it's small enough that you meet people, you remember people and you run into people so you can see them at the grocery store, you can see them at a football game, you can see them at the high school function. So you run into your patients. So as a result, we, or at least I do, go out of my way to try to get to know my patients on a more personal level because I get to see them on a regular basis. Um, know each other at the Rose Bowl too. Correct. <laughs> at Universal Studios. I mean, what more do you want? It's a small world. Um, so um, I practiced, I bought my practice 23 years ago. I, um, after dental school, I came to town. I was an associate for a dentist. That was working out okay. And um, this opportunity came up where this dentist was retiring. And uh, I actually purchased his practice, and I've been there for 23 years. Um, it's been a great choice. I'm a sole practitioner. I take care of my own patients. I make all my own decisions. Um, so I'm responsible for everything. Um, and so that puts a lot of pressure on yourself, but those are your decisions, and it's very rewarding. Um, my staff, I have a small office. The reason why I say it's small is I don't have a lot of redundancies. I have a full-time assistant, hygienist, receptionist, and myself. And I couldn't do it without a, another person who's not here, and that's my wife. Um, she also attended the University of Illinois, but she is my, basically my CFO. She will pay my bills, take care of taxes, does the payroll, she'll order materials and equipment, she will update my computers, whatever I need, she seems to get it done for me. So I couldn't do it without her. So really there's like five people that won my practice. Um, so how did I get to where I am today? Well. First of all, I had to decide what I wanted to be when I grow up. So, you know, in high school, you take your ACT, you take those uh, interest exams, and think, well, what's good, what's bad? So, actually, for myself, there were a couple things that I, that I found um, that I enjoyed. One of the things I had done growing up is I had worked at a swimming pool, I taught, taught swimming lessons, coached swimming. Um, I was always one-on-one -on -one with people. I enjoyed working with these kids at a day camp, so I was a people person. I really wanted to be with people, so I thought, how can I be with people? And um, so that was one direction I wanted to go. Um, another thing I really enjoyed was, um, I really enjoyed working with my hands. Um, as a teenager, we made balsa wood airplanes, we whittled, I liked to fish, I tied knots. I was crafty, I liked to use my hands, so I'm like, okay, so I've got something else I want to do. I don't want to sit in front of a computer all day real important was I really like medicine. My father was a drug salesman. I had some members of the family that were in medicine. They were doctors. My uncle's an oral surgeon. So I really liked medicine. I liked biology. I liked plants. I liked the way things work. I liked living structures. I tell my engineers, I said, I like things with heartbeats because they just, you know, they're into structures and form and whatever. And I'm like, I like things that move and breathe. So that, so how could I bring that all together? So that's when I went to the, Univ went to, went to the U of I and applied to um, the biology program, was accepted, and went through school. So I think I had a pretty typical career at Illinois. I loved the U of I. I had a blast. Football team was good at the time. We went to the Rose Bowl. <laughs> I went to the Rose Bowl. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, freshman year was pretty typical. You leave high school. You come to school. You get average grades. Okay, and you think, i got to do better than that. Sophomore year rolls around, and now we're starting to get into the biology curriculum. And my scores were getting better, but they still weren't great. So, so then I was thinking, what am I going to do with my biology degree? And then dentistry came to mind, and I thought, I have to really work on this. So my junior and senior year, my grades improved. They really jumped. I really put a focus and studied a lot. Um, I changed my study patterns. I had buddies I studied with. The two other guys I studied with, one's an MD and one's a vet. So the three of us would spend all, all hours studying. Another thing that we did was, or at least I did, was to get into dental school, you have to take the DAT, the Dental Aptitude Test. Well, I took it cold, and I thought, well, I'll just take it and see what it looks like. Well, I scored a little bit above average, and I thought, no, this is not going to work. Dental school is very competitive to get into, so I went and actually paid um, 
a whole semester I did a, a prep class for the DAT. It paid off. I scored very well on the exam. It, um, there's some visual aptitude parts of that that you don't get from reading books. You have to just practice some of these puzzles that's a part of the test and I scored very well so I knew that that helped. Um, another part of getting into any kind of professional school is re letters of recommendation. It's very easy to go to class, sit in a lecture, take your test, say hi to the professor and walk out. Well, at some point you're going to have to ask a professor, I need a letter of recommendation. And they don't know who you are. You don't know who they are. So m one of the things that I felt was important was I finally got to know some of my professors. I went to, I went to office hours. I went to speak with them. I shared things about me and they, sh they shared things about themselves that you wouldn't hear in a lecture. So my point is if you're, you need these letters and you if you give them some information about personal about yourself, their letter will be much better and more received, or better received for whatever school you're applying to. So that was basically the U of I. So I uh, had to apply to dental school. At the time, there were four dental schools in the state of Illinois. There was Loyola, Northwestern, Southern Illinois, which is in Alton, and it's still there, and then the U of I. Um, I actually... Um, I got accepted and had interviews at Southern, Loyola, and Northwestern. I heard nothing from UIC at Chicago. I'm like, oh gosh, what's going on? So instead of just sitting here waiting, I thought, well, I had some time to kill. So I called them up and I said, you know, can I come see your school? I'd love to have a tour. They said, well, can you come on Tuesday? I said, fine. So off I went. So Tuesday rolled around. I went in and I, I was introduced to the assistant dean. He took me around the building. We had a great conversation. The conversation went really well. I felt really good about it. And so then when we were saying our goodbyes, he said to me, he said, he said, well, it just happens on Thursday that the um, admissions committee is meeting, and we'll go over your application then. I thought, that's a good sign. He wouldn't have said that if he didn't think anything, think fondly of me. So actually on Friday, he called me and he said verbally that I was accepted, so I was excited. So my point is, don't just wait. Make a point to contact someone, call someone, make yourself visible. I put my face with my application two days before they reviewed my application. It worked for me. I really wanted to go to the U of I. It was important for me because one, it was cost effective. Loyola and Northwestern are now out of business. They have closed. It was too expensive to run those dental schools. And my girlfriend lived in St. Charles and she's now my wife and I think it paid off in the long run. So, so that's how dental school is. Um, dental school is very similar to med school, a little bit different. Um, your first year of dental school, you spend a lot of time learning your basic sciences. You're going to learn your anatomy, your physiology, your histology, your um, micro, your biochemistry, all the basics, everything that's healthy. And at the same time, you have your book work, and then you're learning a lot of the dental technical skills that you're going to need. So you're doing two sets of coursework, so you're in the building a lot. Um, your second year, it really focuses on pathology, what's wrong, what's abnormal. So you're doing all your pathology, your, your um, head and neck things, and so the, all your sciences stay the same, very similar to your med school rotations. But at the same time, now you're at a lab bench doing technical dental things. You're learning how to make crowns, bridges, do root canals, clean teeth, how to make a denture. So you've got it's a double whammy. You've got your academics and then you've got the, your, your hands, back to using your hands. So that's how the second year dental school is. Third and fourth year are a little bit different because now you're doing clinical work. You have patients, you have live patients that come into your clinic, you set up appointments, you run it like a dental practice, and you actually perform procedures on those patients. You have professors or dentists that will judge you, evaluate you, help you, but the last two years are basically in the clinic. You still have some lecture material and um, that's important as well because you're studying specific topics in dentistry. How do you get a license in dentistry? Um, some of this may have changed but I think it's pretty basic. After the second year and the fourth year in dental school you take a national written board exam. If you pass those national board exams you are then eligible for a licensing exam. Well, I wanted to stay in Illinois. I wanted to come back to Champaign. That was my goal. I wanted to come back home because I thought word of mouth would help when you're trying to establish a practice for yourself and you know people in the community, this is the place to be. So, 
I took the Northeast Regional Board, so that's the, the exam that was given for the Northeast Region. So I could be licensed in any state to the Northeast of Illinois. So um, Vermont, Maine, New York, Ohio, I can go anywhere in those directions. So I took that and passed, and that was great. Um, at the same time, I'm thinking, okay, dental school is ending. What am I going to do next? Do I go into private practice? Do I buy a practice? And back of my mind, I said, I like medicine. I still like medicine. Um, so what I did was I had gone back to my dentist and I talked to him. He said, well, how's dental school? And I told him. He says, well, he said, if you come back to Champaign, you're going to have a hard time getting additional education because if you set up a practice in Champaign, you're not going to be able to just run to Chicago and take class whenever you want because you'll be too busy. So I wasn't interested in being an endodontist or any other specialist like an oral surgeon or a pediodontist or a periodontist. So what I found out was there's a program called a general practice residency. It's a residency program that's established in the major teaching hospitals. Not all hospitals have them, but that's what I decided. I thought this way I could work with my, I learn about medically compromised people because I knew that as my patients get older, they're going to be on all kinds of medicines. They're going to have medical issues. They're going to have heart problems. They're going to have lung problems. They're going to have, go through chemotherapy. How does that affect them dentally and medically? So I worked at Loyola Medical Center for a year. It was a one-year program. We did rotations through internal medicine, ear, nose, and throat. They loved us. They loved the dental residents because we knew the anatomy. We knew the head, neck, anatomy, so they didn't have to explain anything. We spent time with oral surgery. We spent time with anesthesia. And then we had an outpatient clinic where, where we treated medically compromised patients. These patients came from the hospital to us. So they, we knew their doctors. We knew that, who had treated them and things like that. We would work up patients that were going to have a heart transplant or kidney transplant. Um, we had some bone marrow transplants. Of patients, so and then we were on a general consult service for the hospital. So if something bizarre would happen, or there would be an accident, and they needed a dental consult, they'd call us. So it was wonderful. It was a year working in the hospital. Um, as you know, when you're in a dentist, you can kind of set your hours Monday through Friday, if you will. But in a hospital, a hospital is 24/7, and that includes all the holidays. And so I have a respect for my MDs that work in the hospital because they don't get a break. They can't just say, oh, "I'm going to take vacation here." It doesn't always work that way. Then the, after I finished my GPR, I came back to Champaign, and again, 23 years later, here I am speaking with you guys. I, it's been an honor. Um, I think dentistry has a lot to offer. Um, the technology that is out there is changing. Um, people are interested in cosmetic dentistry. Um, there's uh, more and more digital processes that are occurring, dig digital x-rays, digital impressions. Um, some things work, some things don't. Um, as a sole practitioner, you have to do your own research to realize if I got to take on this new project or buy this equipment. Um, so it has a lot to offer. Um, dentistry, as, as a sole practitioner, I like because, it, again, it's my decisions. You can go into a group practice. There's managed health care, and that there's all those things that go with it. So um, I think dentistry as a profession in the future has a lot to offer. I'm not sure where it's going to go because of what how the government's trickling down with their medicine. But dentistry right now has not been touched too much. So um, it's, it's a good field for right now. So I would be happy to answer any of your questions um, later this evening. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is, uh, like me, is originally from the North Shore of Chicago and is recently transplanted to uh, the Champaign-Urbana area. Um, uh, Dr. Rosencrantz is now director of the residency program in internal medicine at the Carl Clinic, correct? At U of I, University of Illinois in Champaign. And so Dr. Rosencrantz will now tell us about her career path. Well, <clears throat> I'm Holly Rosencrantz. I am deeply honored to be here. So yes, I did. I used to sit in 100 noise lab, uh, Chem 101, okay? And my father, who's 86, sat in Chem, uh, did Chem 101 in a 100 noise lab, and my sister um, as well. So I, um, and I think something, uh, the whole time you guys were talking, I was nodding my head like a, like a bobble doll because I could, so much of what you both said resonated with me. So if there was a contest who bled the most orange and blue, though, I, I think we, we could duke it out. Um, <laughs> you know. Because I, uh, 
my fan, I, there's something happened to me here, and I saw so as an undergraduate, and um, I just love being in Champaign Urbana. So um, we're going to address. So uh, um, I decided to give a presentation, so I didn't, didn't uh, amble about and just blibber. And my son told me I cannot do gangnam style dancing for you, uh, which <laughs> um, so then that's included. So uh, um, the question posed to me is: Tell us about. Please describe. What I, what I should say, what is my path to and in medicine, what I now do, and what it's like to be a woman in medicine. So I'm going to try to address that. There will be an exam afterwards. No, OK. All right. No exam. All right. Next. So it all started. <laughs> This is the person that's giving you the advice. Uh, that's me in the foreground. So um, I started out as just a regular kid in 1904 to 1956, and that's my sister. And um, I did not have any particular brilliance or aptitude for uh, um, anything in particular. It was just a, a regular kind of kid. Next slide. Um, I was in seventh grade at Elm Place. Anybody from Highland Park or Middle and uh, North Shore? And anyway, anyway, oh, did you go? Did you go to Elm Place? No, you didn't. All right. Okay. Okay. New chair. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. All right. So, oh my God. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> North Shore. Okay. Anyway, sorry. So um, when I was in. Uh, Fifth, seventh grade at Elm Place Middle School, I was just this very average student getting C's and, and, and I, kind of what you said, Dr. Martin, resonated with me a little bit in terms of, you know, you don't necessarily have this, this apt, necessarily an aptitude, and something clicks and all of a sudden you just kind of get some of that focus. And I saw this movie called Hemo the Magnificent. Now I looked at this movie again and the guy giving the discussions talking about blood, I was riveted by this movie, absolutely fascinated. The gentleman talking, he's smoking a cigarette, and the EKG on the back, the, the, there's a chest x-ray in the background, it's backwards. But I didn't, I didn't, that didn't, that didn't, at that time in 19, the 1960s. And I was absolutely captured by um, biology. And the next slide. And I had an aptitude for it. It's an old, this is called a textbook. And anyway, this is an ancient <laughs> textbook of biology. But I truly, um, I, uh, I, I was, much like you, Dr. Martin, I, I was also, you had a sense, I like living things, I like biology. And I wasn't as crazy about plants as I was uh, biology. So, and then finally, next slide, um, role models. So my parents had a very good friend, um, the, the gentleman was a physician, he was a psychiatrist actually, very, very nice man. That's not him, but circa. Um, anyway, uh, this makes a great Halloween costume if you put a thing on. Anyway, um, but the, uh, um, and I used to look at his diploma from the University of Illinois, and I would pretend it's a doctor of medicine. I would pretend my name, he had it in his basement, and I remember looking at it, and something that, about that resonated with me, too. So aptitude role model and some, just recognizing that this was a direction. Now, that doesn't mean if you're in economics or, or social sciences, I, I don't think you have to have this traditional trajectory where you're into science. But for me, that worked. Next slide. So I've got to give a shout out to um, the next step. The next step was getting through high school, Deerfield High School, and um, doing reasonably well in high school because I started to have this dream of going into medicine. Um, the seed that was planted before I think I was even conceived, uh, the seed to go to the University of Illinois was planted. Here are my parents, uh, circa about 1950, in front of the alma mater. Um, and uh, I think I've, I was born with the uh, diploma for the University of Illinois. So uh, it's, it's been with me for a long time. I also want to give a shout out to my parents uh, who were um, profoundly supportive of me. And I, my father's a mechanical engineer from the University of Illinois. So. <laughs> <laughs> and an electrical engineer. So anyway, just had to add that. But anyway, next slide. So uh, I attended the University of, of Illinois from 1974 to 1978. Does anybody know who this is? Chief. The chief? Yeah, we have the chief. This was before it was politically incorrect. So I just wanted to have that. Uh, to have this. Um, and uh, I found something happened to me here. It was self-confidence, something about, um, and I fell in love with the University of Illinois. And I, I'm i no genius, but I, there was something, I was inspired. I found a study plan. I, much like you said, you know, you just sort of find ways in. You find people to study with. You find people who have similar values. And you study together, and you walk by the quad. You don't look at all those people throwing frisbees and having so much fun. And you just you walk by everything, and you just go to the undergraduate library and and get through it all. But um, it was I had this goal, and it's nice to have a vision. So um, I, I did reasonably well. Just had similar similar experience taking the med cats. And you know, this is before Kaplan was popular. This is <clears throat> for me. 
Kaplan was very new, and I thought it was a sin to take Kaplan. But I, I did all right the first time, but the second time I did much better. And, and now that's sort of the expectation. And it was I learned a lot doing it, so there's no shame in taking a course. Next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my undergraduate ex academics and experiences. I started out in food science in the College of Agriculture because I didn't believe I would ever get into medical school. It was very competitive, much like dental school. I didn't believe I would get in. Um, and I started out in food science. I have often regretted not staying in food science. I think it's a fascinating field now. But I was doing reasonably well, and then I changed my major to microbiology. I probably could have stayed in, in food science, but I was going more for the life sciences. I, um, the plus is where I had strong foundation for my M1 year, very similar to dental school. Um, minus is that for my electives, I took the history of medicine. Really, does anybody really care who, um, you know, the, uh, you know, Hippocrates and all? I mean, yes, of course we care, but I should have taken other things that made, would make me more uh, a more rounded person. And I actually made up for that, I think, more in, in, in recent years. But um, I wish I had taken more broader courses. I wish I had a more broad experience. And, and I think you talked about that. Seize the time. Do things. You did fencing. Seize your undergraduate opportunities. It's just fantastic. I was a lab assistant in agronomy in one of those buildings on campus. And I was a resident advisor at LAR, Lincoln Avenue Residence Hall. Who lives at LAR? Anybody? Any LAR? Oh, my god. OK, anyway. <laughs> So I just want to tell you one as a side take, turn off the thing, but we were on a non-vis floor and I snuck a guy up once, but okay, that's, <laughs> that's just, anyway, all right. So anyway, but next slide. So uh, summer employment, did I have some huge research opportunity? Was I, you know, doing calcium channels and turtle bladders? No, I was not. I worked at toxicology at Abbott. I was very lucky. My father, the engineer, was an instrument engineer. I got jo summer jobs at Abbott. I worked in, t in, uh, in maintenance. We used to write out uh, work orders. I did help one summer, though we did coat rabbits with Selsun Blue, um, and but <laughs> helping to bring out that out. It was a fair, fairly humane uh, experimentation. But I did have those experiences. And I was a camp counselor in day camp, uh, at, a, at a day camp, um, which made me almost made me never have children, but I <laughs> actually did go ahead and do that. Next slide. Um, I did uh, get into the University of Illinois. Uh, my funny story about the U of I is I got into Rush with this beautiful registered letter this was before email, before so I, we got a registered letter. Um, I heard nothing from the U of I, and uh, you know, there was some, I, my parents were pretty cool. They didn't open my mail, and so there, there was a stack of mail, and my dad, they, they got, there was this third class mail thing in a brown container, you know, just, and there was a catalog for the U of I in it, and in the catalog, folded over, was my acceptance letter, and it said, Dear Miss Rosencrantz, you are tentatively reserved a spot. It was, really, that is how, and I, I have the letter, uh, but that's how I got into Illinois. I said, open your mail, you never know, but anyway, I got into the University of Illinois, and um, I, which is right across from the dental school. And boy, let me tell you, those dentists, they knew their head and neck anatomy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you were smart to date a dentist because then you'd get your head and neck stuff too. We did not know that. You guys used to carry around those skulls. It was really impressive. So <laughs> you have to have, pick your friends. Um, so I attended uh, the University of Illinois. And, uh, and then um, because of my love for the University of Illinois, I scratched my head real hard and did my residency at the University of Illinois. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And this included the West Side VA, now the Jesse Brown VA. So that's what I did from 1982 to 1985. And now, like Dr. Martin, I, you know, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. There wasn't family medicine at the time. There wasn't hospitalists at the time. Um, what I had admired when I was a resident, and you know, how do you pick what you do? You have role models, you know, and you or, and you don't nothing. There's not one. I, I liked nephrology. I liked renal. I liked everything, much like you did. And I found that the, um, I was very impressed with the internal medicine residents. And again, mentorship, find mentors. Mentorship is everything. So uh, the internal medicine residents were really smart. And I remember hearing the two urologists in the hallway and they went in the stairwell and they were whispering and they said, consult medicine, they can fix anything. And I thought, you know what? I wanna be the guy, the pers person who could potentially fix anything. So I chose a residency in internal medicine and um, uh, when I was finished with that, I, I wasn't sure exactly what, what I wanted to do. And then sometimes things present themselves to you. So not every, don't be anxious. I, if you don't have this like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna do this, this, and this. And at the time, next slide. Oh, I did this too. <laughs> Can we check out this orange tuxedo, okay? Okay, 
So I also had, was very blessed that I met my husband during medical school, and I did get married during medical school, and uh, I took one day off from ob at Illinois Masonic, um, but I had uh, my, re my resident let me take the day off, but we had, and then we did postponed our honeymoon. Um, and I have, much like yourself, I have been married to uh, my husband for 32 years, and he's been a rock solid support for me. And that's another thing. Find partners that uh, support you from in, in all ways. So next slide. Um, so my start of my career path in academic internal medicine and primary care, which is what I do now, um, is that I, I recognize I wanted to work in teaching settings with medical students and residents. I love medical students and residents. I did not favor one particular specialty. There's no such thing as a hospitalist, which I might have chosen. And I wanted to start a family and have flexibility. Uh, the reason I put that text in blue is this is a continuous thread that I, of this, the one thing that's always been a thread for me is academic medicine. That began actually at, next slide, um, I was. Give, I went to Illinois Masonic. I was their fourth year chief resident. They had only. They had, there's three years for internal medicine residency. They were looking for a fourth year chief. Recruited me as a fourth year chief resident. I had never had the administrative duties. I was next thing I know. I was looking at budgets. I was doing um, scheduling. I was doing counseling. I was um, talking people out of killing themselves. I mean, seriously. You know, there, it was the most. I was completely unprepared for the depth and breadth of personal problems and social problems and scheduling problems. And it was uh, probably the beginning of, you know, fast forward 30 years, here I'm a program director. But that presented itself to me. So you never know what's going to present itself to you. Next slide. Um, from that, the segue from that is they had Illinois Masonic had this women's health resources clinic that was very popular in the 80s, especially with suddenly we, they, the medical community woke up and said, oh my gosh, we are only doing studies in men. And uh, women's health became, uh, there was a real niche for, and it still is, but uh, so we were a primary care group for women. There's a huge challenge for me filling in gaps in training. So I trained at the university and the VA. We had mostly male patients. I didn't know anything about birth control pills and doing pap smears and things like that. And I, I really learned on the job, and I think we both have all, we've all learned on the job. I was an employed physician, so I didn't have to deal with the things that you've that you're dealing with all the, I, I just got a paycheck. I was part-time. Um, it was inpatient and outpatient, which is an all traditional, which is a model that's now all virtually gone. Um, and I was having the challenge of balancing home, child care. I did have some kids, I'll tell you about that in a minute, and work, okay? In the meantime, though, while at Illinois Masonic, was a U of I College of Medicine affiliated site, so I consistently was working with students and residents, with medical students and residents. Let me just inject in this time, because it's part of it. At no time, though, I don't know if I'm just, maybe I laughed it off, maybe I, I, I and especially, I did not feel at all threatened or challenged because I was a woman. If anything, being a woman is a you become, the biology hasn't changed, you are still the mom. And if anything was challenging, it wasn't that um, I ever felt um, discriminated against, but just being a woman, you are the, you are the parent, the female parent, and it, it, it's, it does change things. I don't care how modern, um, how modern and, and advanced we are, but um, women are women, and we still, we're, we do the childbearing, and you're still the mom. But next slide. Um, so then I did this, um, and I do recommend having adult children. <laughs> 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 it's easier, like you can call them and say, what kind of wine should I bring? Or you can call your son five minutes before this and say, what room in the email? Well, that was the email I got that said, don't do the gangham dance. Anyway, um, but uh, these, uh, my children defined me and I was very blessed that I chose careers that basically until my son was about 12 or 13, I was part-time. Part-time means I'm on the phone while I'm home, but it's, or I'm ang in angst at home, but you're, at least you're home, you're a presence. And when I was able to work within about a 20 minute radius of my, of my home. Next slide. Um, from from a, a lateral move for me, we moved to the suburbs. Well, bad. oh my God. And uh, then we went, to, I was at St. Francis Hospital of Evanston and uh, there was uh, having a 20 minute commute. Um, I was in an identical clinical and practice setting. Continued challenge of balancing home and, and and work with child care, wonderful husband, and always very lucky. Um, still working with residents and medical students, a common thread for me. Next slide. Um, and then we purchased with St. Fran Francis. Lots of changes in medicine, as you alluded to. 2000, they got rid of uh, 
of uh, physician-owned practices, the pendulum swung all the way back now, and I think most physicians can't survive. And I admire you, Dr. Martin, for surviving on, uh, having your own practice in dentistry. It's very difficult now. So I think the paradigm is shifting because no one can afford electronic medical records and so forth. But this was 2000. It's no longer employed physician. Huge learning curve for running your own our own office. I admire you. I it was overwhelming. Billing, insurance, staffing, equipment, man. So this was a great learning curve for me. Um, we did broaden our practice to include men in more general private practice. Again, still working with medical students and residents. But let me tell you something. We barely broke even. We were not we were not sophisticated business people. We were working in Evanston. We did break even, but it was it was a very challenging time. Next, and then possibly the combination of just struggling so much to keep the practice afloat. And now I've been out in practice for 15 plus years, 20 years. I'm feeling like I'm not going anywhere. I'm feeling like I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And unlike you, and I envy and admire you because I felt burnt out. I really was burnt out in primary care. It was the same thing every Friday. I was telling, trying to talk people out of having a Z pack. Everyone's a Z pack on Friday afternoon. And, and then people, right, let's face it, and everybody wants, you know, and then there's this, a period of time when women wanted me to check their arsenic levels in their hair. And, and it just, and people, you know, they whatever the disease, of, you know, the, whatever was, was popular, mitral valve, of prolapse and everything, you know, it, whatever it was, I just felt I was burned out. I admit it, guys, I was burned out and I was not enjoying my work. Okay, so next slide. So I recertified in internal medicine. What do you do when you're burned out? You recertify. I, try, I was trying to give myself some, I needed some new skills. I wanted to make myself more attractive market in the market. I did a mobile medicine van. That was really interesting through St. Francis. And then I interviewed at Abbott for a pharmacovigilance job. I actually considered leaving clinical medicine. I was waiting to hear from them, and I had kind of sent my resume to UIC again, and I got accepted for a position on the faculty. Next slide. And I hit the ground running in 2005, and that was about one of the most energizing, and it was just one, I thought this was my last hurrah, and we were on the wards, and this is one of my favorite pictures. This was just we were, our team rounding, we have pharmacists, I think we have a dental student there, OMF, OMFS or facial surgery resident. Um, every rate, we have about five languages, five countries, five, half men, half women. This is just a typical day at UIC and I love the diversity. And it was very intense, it was wards and clinic, it was very intense. Next slide. And um, it was my first exposure to electronic medical records which has changed everybody's life. Um, and uh, I even did some research for the first time. Again, still now really, really, really engrossed with medical students and residents. And um, next slide. And then sure enough, within about five years, so and all of a sudden, I think as we get older, our, you know, you start to see your life like, well, I, I, I haven't completed my life, but I, it was extremely, it was, it was uh, 12, 14 hour days and a long commute to the city. And um, it was great, but I started to get burned out again. It was very, very intense, very, very intense. And I started to think, rethink the career that was heavily clinical medicine. Um, the growing practice was associated with increasing paperwork, do documentation, time requirements. I really got burned out. So I'm, I'm telling you a little bit of the negative side. It's not all just like, oh, la, la, la. You know, it's, I got burnt out again. But it was, five, you know, five, was sort of five, five years later. And my husband decided to semi retire, and I wanted to have more flexibility in my schedule. So what did I do? I um, got this corporate job. All of a sudden, next thing, I always had this fantasy of wearing pantyhose and having a briefcase, and I got to do that. <laughs> and I just, I had never done that job. So I finally got that job, and I did consulting. We did, we sit in the big offices and review charts, and I learned even more about Meditech and, and Epic, and I learned all sorts of, and we learned about um, analyzing mission criteria and mission status. Again, it's big, or, so I learned about organizational, hospital administration, and so forth. Um, I was using my clinical skills. We were doing chart reviews, but no, not having direct patient contact. And that was, that was interesting. It was fun, and they, like you had lunch. Like you could eat lunch, and it was like people actually <laughs> ate lunch. And no one took off their clothes, and no one threw up. And it was just really <laughs> nice, you know, and, I, and it was interesting. But then, and then I decided, remember I took the history of medicine for an elective. How about, I never, I was always felt that I was so deficient. I'm part, very part-time now, and I went to night school in National Lewis in Chicago, and I got a master's degree in public policy. And I was suddenly studying social studies and po comparative politics and um, sending my son my papers at midnight to reform it, because then I learned how to PowerPoint. I learned how to 
to write and write a grant and it was it was a fantastic experience. So what do you do? Here's a here I'm you know in my mid fifties. It's time to just sort of maybe sit back and then my sister sent me an email. She said, Hey Hal, how would you like to live in Urbana? And I was like, ha 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 ha, you know, <laughs> right? Because you know, my mother is um, I just lost my mom, but my dad's out, my, my elderly father still lives in Highland Park and I was like, they for a program director for internal medicine, which I didn't think I was qualified for, but I just for the heck of it, I kind of at the last minute, I under the deadline, I sent in my resume. I have a funny story about that. Guess what I am? I'm the program director for the internal medicine residency here. Um, when I got the um, email, um, I, they did a video interview first, and uh, so we did it through Skype, and then um, they sent me an email and they said, Dear Dr. Rosenkrantz, we'd like you to have a site visit. So my son is down here. Can you imagine if your parents called you and said, um, we're moving to Champaign? Can you imagine, <laughs> except for you? So my son got that phone call, Doug. We might be moving to Champaign. Anyway, so he's a, lives at, he's a resident advisor at Allen Hall. Anyway, um, but before that happened, um, I used to love to come down to Champaign for any reason, so they invited me down for a site visit, and so I just forwarded to my husband. I wrote, road trip, with a million explanation points. And um, so that night I came home, I said, what do you think of my email? He said, what email? And he got it, so I was like, oh, I must not have pressed send. Well, it turns out I replied to the head of the hospital. <laughs> Careful what you do with your email. So, Dr. Marshall, Dr. William Marshall, a very nice man. He's uh, his email for 24 hours. He thought my response to him was road trip. <laughs> so, when I had the interview, I figure what <laughs> the WTF? I'm not going to get this job. So, why am I even nervous? I wasn't even nervous. It was kind of fun. And he kept saying, this has got to be the right person anyway. And when I left that day, I said to them, thank you so much. This was really nice. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, to make it easier for these very nice people. And then I got, and, and well, needless to say, I guess this tells the story. So but I'm almost done. I'm almost done. There will be the exam, will be a exam right after. So no, I'm kidding. The one more, I got it. just a couple more slides. So my program, as a program director, I'm probably doing all the stuff I learned to do over the past 25 years, you know oversight, education, clinical, scholarly activity, you know, but budgets, all the stuff that I've been training, I guess I've been training to do this job for a while. Next slide. Um, so what's next for me? I, I, you know, I want to remain active with the university community, continue to work with some global health initiative that I'm doing with some of the students. I want to take my boards again, oh God. Uh, I want to continue mentorship. My husband and I are taking panel lessons. So I want to continue to expand, and do philanthropy, community service. Um, that's kind of next. I wanted to think about what's coming on for me, but I think the last slide is most important. <laughs> I just think as you look at your journey, and this is the last slide, I promise it helps to have a very supportive partner, be it a traditional or non-traditional partner. Have flexibility in your work schedule to allow for childcare and life events. Recognize fatigue and burnout. It's okay. And you said this is so important. It's okay if you change your mind. It's okay if you say, I'm going to be a cardiologist. It's like when I interview residency candidates, I want to be a cardiologist. And I want them to say, but it's okay if you, you know, it's okay if you change your mind. But I think you have to reinvent yourself periodically and allow your goals to change and keep learning new things because that's what, otherwise you're in that, that like that running on that, that treadmill and you get depressed. So I think I've reinvented myself. Um, I don't know where, you know, who knows where I'm going to go next, but I hope that, thank you for, this is the most self-centered, egotistical discussion, talk I've ever given, <laughs> but thank you for listening. That is my life, and thank you very much for letting me be here. I don't know how you follow that. I don't think you can. <laughs> Jimmy Fallon, it should be Holly Rosencrantz. <laughs> Again, my name is Rich Berkowitz, and I obviously am also a grad of the University of Illinois, but I am the sort of uh, champion of the bleeding hearts, okay? I'm the one who was on the edge, on the edge of not coming to Champaign, on the edge of not getting into medical school, and so I understand where a lot of you are, and those are the people that I really champion because there are a lot of you that your credentials are impeccable, as I saw from the essays, and there are others who are just sort of right on that edge, and so our goal is hopefully to, to get you there to get you people there because I know a lot of you will get there anyway. But anyway, the, the story that I like to tell is back when I applied to school here, and probably you guys remember this, you used to get an IBM printout of your schedule. I got an IBM printout. We didn't have electronic scheduling and all that stuff like you do now. So 
on the printout, okay, this is exactly what it said. So I called a friend of mine who was a, who was a freshman at the time at Champaign, and I said, which building is Shemin X? <laughs> and he goes, in a few sort of interesting adjectives, he goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, well, he said, my chemistry class, Chem 101, is in Shemin X. And he goes, no, that's Chem Annex, okay? So now when I tell you the next story, you're going to think, how did this guy ever get into medical school? <laughs> so then the next class was Chem Lab, okay? So then I asked him, I said, where is No Yes Lab? Because <laughs> it was separated by about a quarter of an inch on the schedule. So here I am, you know, I'm a high school senior, and I'm like literally thinking literally. I said, okay, no, yes. And so, no. Then I found out, ironically, we're here today in Noise Lab. Okay. All right. So next slide. So this is me. All right, so what was I going to do? In, in high school, I wasn't really, at least the beginning, was a great student because all I had on my mind was baseball. My kids love this picture, and they say, who are you kidding when they see this? Um, so where did it all start? At Niles East High School on the North Shore, which no longer exists. It's now closed. And then one of the hospitals I did my residency at, Michael Reese Hospital, is now closed. So hopefully the University of Illinois will stay open. Okay. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so... Uh, Oh, really, these are some of the famous lines over the past 30 years since I left, 33 years. Not with those grades, you're not. So I went to see my high school counselor as a sophomore, and she said, where do you want to go to college? And I said, I want to go to the University of Illinois, and that was her response to me. So as a sophomore, I had to change my MO and decide, okay, maybe at 5'6", 160, I wasn't going to be a professional baseball player, so I should think about something else. What do you mean I didn't get in? And this is what I'm talking about. I had gotten into Knox College because I wanted to play baseball. I had gotten into Washington University because I wanted to swim. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But I applied to the University of Illinois under pre-med bio. Okay? Well, I got a rejection letter from the University of Illinois. And so I had been advised to apply under general curriculum. And I said, no, I'm going to be the purist. I'm gonna, I want to be a doctor. I want to apply under pre-med. Well, guess what? I didn't get in. So. I called, and I think Dr. Martin referred to it originally, you have to be a self-advocate. Because if, if you don't advocate for yourself, it's going to be really hard to find somebody to advocate for you. Okay? So what I did is I got on the phone with the admissions office. Yes, it wasn't electronic then. You had to call somebody. And I did get a voice. I didn't get an answering machine. And I said, I just got rejected from the University of Illinois, but I think I should get in. What should I do? The gentleman on the phone, I cannot remember his name, he said to me, he said, I want you to reapply as soon as you can under LES general curriculum. And you know what? I got in. Okay? And I was happy because my mind was set since the time I was four years old. Because to me, if you live in the state, there is no other school to go to. It's got to be University of Illinois. That's just the way that I felt. So that was the second part of the story. So I did get in. Yes, I'm a distant cousin, so what? So we used to line up in the armory to get our grades, and it was hot. It was 110 in the armory. We used to sweat like crazy in order to get our schedules. So I walk up, and at the time, it was in, in those years, at the time, Son of Sam was a very prominent figure in the news on the front page of all the newspapers, okay? And so I walked up, and the woman behind the desk said, are you related? And I said, yes. <laughs> and so, no. so, so I said, I, so I decided I'd have to say no, because otherwise I wouldn't get the class I wanted to get. So in other words, no. So that was the other story, my first registration in the armory. Next. I got a what? A D? Can't be. It's, it's over now. Well, that was my first exam at the University of Illinois. I walked into my calculus exam. I was ready for it. There was no way that I was going to get anything except an A. So what was the first thing that happened? For some reason, the TA decided he wanted us to regurgitate all the theorems. He said, what is theorem 2.1 in chair? And I'm like, what? And so I don't memorize. I'm an applications guy, OK? I don't know about memorizing theorems. So the whole test was that. So you know who got only one grade? The, the first grade was a 98. Freaking engineering student, OK? <laughs> memorized everything. The next two highest grades were a 69 and a 68. One was mine. I was the 68. It was another pre-med that was 69. At the end of the year, at the end of the semester, I had missed an A by a point. So I walked into the TA's office, being the self-advocate, and I said, you know what, come on, one point, and you know that first test was a bomb. Said, sorry, I can't do it. So I ended up with a B in my calculus class, but as you can see, I survived, okay? 
look at you morons laughing in the face of death. We used to take our Bio 110, 111 exams in the auditorium, right? And so I remember one year that somebody yelled out something right before the proctors had handed out the exams and the whole crowd was laughing and some voice from the balcony yelled out, look at you morons laughing in the face of death. I don't know if that guy ever got into medical school or not. <laughs> so then, next, 20% 20 20 yield, the sodium carbonate was defective, okay? That was my caffeine extraction test in organic chem lab, okay? And I said, there is no way it's 20%. That was the first lab, right? I don't know if it still is or not in organic chem, but whatever it is, I said, I can't do this because this is gonna impact the whole grade, so I dropped it, yes? We had to play the games when we were here as well, all right? So I dropped organic chem lab, and you know what I got the next time? I got a 98% on my caffeine extraction test, so I did okay. And then finally, FLB is, well not finally, FLB is locked, now what? Now we're creatures of habit. We like to study in the same way. Some people like to study in their shorts. Other people like to study in their pants. Some people like to study with music playing. Other people don't like to study with music playing. I love to study in the foreign language building, okay? And one time we had walked out, we had left our stuff in there. For some reason the janitors locked the door and we couldn't get back in. So we had to wait till the next day to get our study materials. Fortunately the test wasn't for two days. But that was my, we were creatures of habit. We would go back there for four years, that's where I studied. Even when I moved out of my fraternity into the apartment, I studied at the foreign language building. That's what I loved. Next. I would think about another career, Richard, okay? This was the advice, not from the biology advising office, but from the health sciences dean at the time, whose name I will not mention. But anyway, my grade point average was on the cusp. And he said I would think about another career. He didn't know me. If I thought that he knew me and he was trying to motivate me, that he was trying to motivate me, but he wasn't. And so what I'm trying to tell you is don't be discouraged, okay? One or two bad grades doesn't mean anything. And even if you don't get in the first time, that's okay. Okay, there are a lot of people that I interview now at the Indiana School of Medicine, people who have applied three and four times. And you know what, some of those people get in. So don't stop. If that's what you want, then do it. Career alternatives are great too, but don't stop just on the advice of one person. Okay, next slide please. All right, so this is the famous bell curve. And just to show you, I was sort of the average guy. Next slide. Next slide, that's where I was. Whoa, <laughs> and that's where I went. Okay, my educational flow chart, go ahead. All right, so I obviously started out here at the University of Illinois as an undergrad. In undergrad, I, there were a lot of firsts when I was down here at the University of Illinois. But a couple of the things that I did when I was down here, one of the things I got actively involved in was volunteer Illini projects for three years. That was one of the most heartwarming experiences I ever had where I coached uh, some of the kids in Urbana in basketball for three years and it was really great. I got to know them, I got to know their families and they were a lot of underprivileged kids so that was a very worthwhile program to me. And the other first is where I got my first, um, I, had the, I was able to, to get my first teaching job and I taught Biology 100 for the education majors and that was when Dr. George Kiefer was still here and he was the one I walked into his office and I said you know I really want to teach I think that's where I'm headed down the road even if I went into medicine I was going to go into academic medicine and so that's where I got my first my first shot at teaching and I loved it it was really great because I finally knew more than somebody else so it was really good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> then I went to the University of Illinois at Chicago and that was another story getting into medical school because back then we didn't matriculate till the fall. Okay, now a lot of schools want you to commit in the summer if you get in. I had gotten into one other school, but I told you at the beginning, there was only one school for me, that was the University of Illinois. And I finally heard at the beginning of August, and at the time, my girlfriend and I, who is not my wife now, we were traveling out to the western part of the state, and we had just gotten to where we were going, and I got a call from the University of Illinois, okay? My dad had forwarded the number, and they said, we have your spot. We headed right back and I started school three days later, okay? So I didn't have to go to the other school. I was very happy. So I was an, on the eight year plan at the University of Illinois. I then did a pediatric residency uh, at Michael Reese Hospital after medical school. Um, I love children. I had always coached children. I had always taken care of children. My volunteer, I was a camp counselor. Um, I had been a bus driver for camp. I had, my volunteer job as an undergrad was feeding the babies at Children's Memorial Hospital. I got great pleasure out of that. It was really, for me, it was a lot of fun, and that's what my first exposure to medicine and pediatrics, and I really loved it. But then I decided to do an anesthesia residency, and just like Holly talking about changing course, I called my dad and I said, you know what, I'm doing another residency, and I don't even want to tell you the adjective he said. He said, what in the world are you doing that for? Okay, because 
I found out what I really wanted to do was practice pediatric critical care. I wasn't a person, I needed to be moving, as you can tell. I just can't sit still. Things have to be exciting for me, and I like excitement, okay? So I decided I wanted to do pediatric critical care, and that's where I met a mentor, someone else who was a pediatric anesthesiologist who practiced critical care, and he said to me, he said, uh, Rich, if you really want to do peds critical care, do it through anesthesia because if you decide or if you get burned out from pediatric critical care, you can then fall back on anesthesia and you'll have that as a career the rest of your life. And I just want to make it clear, I love medicine as much today as I did when I walked through the doors at the University of Illinois back in 1979 when I started medical school. It's the same thing. I, if I told you that I love my job every day, I'd be lying, but I love what I do. I love practicing medicine. I love practicing anesthesia. So then I uh, was offered a job after I completed my anesthesia residency at Michael Reese. They wanted me to run the pediatric division of the anesthesia department. But I told them I would only take the job if they paid for me to go away and get extra training. I probably could have done the job then, but there was nothing wrong with getting extra training and going places where they could teach you more than you had already learned. And so I went to the hospital for sick children in Toronto, and then I went to the Milwaukee Children's Hospital, uh, where I, I learned from some unbelievable people, some very nationally prominent people who were not only big names in the literature, but they were unbelievable anesthesiologists, and that's where I got my training. So I was very, very lucky. And then I became Director of Pediatric Anesthesia at the University of Illinois Hospital when our practice at Michael Reese took over the practice at the University of Illinois. And then in 1999, when the university was going through some turmoil, I had been offered a job to create my own anesthesia department out in Munster, Indiana, which was a far distance from my home in Glenview, Illinois. So I elected not to move. I elected to stay there so that my kids could go to high school on the North Shore. And so now that's where I've been since 1999. And now I, also, I now again teach medical students as the Indiana University medical students rotate with us at Community Hospital. Um, and I also sit on the admissions committee at IU. Okay, next slide. A little bit of time. Okay, <clears throat> again, educational flow chart. chart you, can, you can go ahead and substitute anesthesiology residency for anything you want. And we've had people in my program when I was training that switched in from internal medicine. I had people that switched in from surgery. I had people that had uh, switched in from, um, uh, from pediatrics. We had people that were double boarded. People had finished training like myself in one area and decided they wanted to do something else. And our chairman at the time was a big advocate of that. He wanted to hire people that had multitude of experiences. He felt that that benefited his department both in the fact that he, it, it gave him a lot of versatility and it was better for training the residents because the internal medicine people, the pediatrics people could teach their residents a little bit more than just pediatric anesthesia or just about adult anesthesia. So then after that, I had my choice. I could enter the job market and decide to do general anesthesia or I could do the fellowship training and I obviously chose to do a little bit extra training in pediatric anesthesia. Um, there's a bunch of fellowships that one can do. These are the four main fellowships. Just recently, the, uh, there is now a certification exam in pediatric anesthesia. The first test is going to be offered in 2013. Um, some of us who have been doing this for a long time are trying to decide whether or not we want to take the exam. We don't know if we're going to do that. But these are the fellowship train, uh, training that you can do. After fellowship, you can decide you can go into academic medicine, which I did. You can go into clinical teaching, clinical research, or laboratory research. I was never a big lab guy. Okay, I had my experience down here at the University of Illinois doing my uh, uh, psychology uh, research with Dr. Greeno's lab. And I used to spend a couple spring breaks here chasing rats all over the laboratory. Okay, or you could go into private practice. Next slide. So what the anesthesiologist must know, I don't know how you guys are, but one of the things that's very disturbing to me is to acquire all of this knowledge and then have to pick something so that you're going to forget something else. I can't stand the notion of forgetting things that I learned, whether it was an undergrad or whether it was in medical school. It just bothered me. I spent all this money, well, back then it wasn't as much, but I spent all this money going to medical school. I spent all this time studying all this information. What field could I go into that would really make this good? I, the anesthesia was exciting for me. Anesthesia was diverse for me. And here is all the things that I have to know on a daily basis. I have to know physiology, okay, and all types of physiology. I have to know cellular physiology. Yes, every once in a while the Krebs cycle still does come up in the discussion. Um, pharmacology, genetics, anatomy, 
internal medicine. I have to know cardiology, pulmonology, and neurology because my patients have a multitude of medical problems. There's a lot of comorbidities and the population's getting sicker. So this is part of the reason why I chose this field is because I needed to know a lot. Okay, I needed to be a jack of all trades. And of course, I had an extra background. I had background in pediatrics, so for me, that part was easy. Obstetrics and gynecology, an understanding of surgical principles, uh, and surgical procedures, and psychology and intensive care medicine. Those were all, it was right up my alley. I could do all these things, and it was exciting for me. I never stood still. I just could not, I wasn't one of those people that could sit in the pediatrician, be a pediatrician, and worry about nausea and vomiting and giving immunizations, and it is very noble, and it's a wonderful thing to do, but I just couldn't do it, okay? And so, next slide. So, where can your career take you, all right? I have had, I've been able to do most of these things. I would, I don't think I ever want to do this part, although I've had to be very political at my job, but I would never want to do this part. This is not up my alley. But I've done clinical research. I've been in a little bit of private practice for a while. I practice academics. Um, I was able to, in my, in my role at the University of Illinois, I was able to become an author and write book chapters. And so for me, that was very exciting. And I love doing it. And my heart really is still in academic medicine. And that's where I think I'm going to end up at the end of my career. I don't think I'm done just in private practice. Um, next slide. So you've made up your mind to go to medical school. What can you expect? OK, it's, um, it's hard. It's hard to get in. But when you look at the ratios, um, the ratios are really no different from the number of people applying to the number of spots, whether it's dental school, whether it's medical school. There are less dental schools than there are medical schools. There are more medical schools coming. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm going to ask Holly and Allison at the end. Um, Holly a little bit more because she's a residency director, so she knows about people applying for residencies. Um, I actually want to stop here because I really think that um, I want to give you guys time to ask your questions. But when you look at the statistics right now, the number of applicants for medical school spots, it's probably somewhere between two and a half to three to one. Okay, The number of applications that were received in 2012, 700,000 applications were received. Obviously, multiple people are applying to multiple spots. All right, so overall, there were about 43,000 applicants to medical school, and almost 50% of those were women. Okay, back when I applied, my medical school class, we were at about 13 or 14%. So now it's close to 50%. So you can see there is a spot, and part of the reason for having Allison and, and Holly here today were to let the women know that there is a role for you in medicine without a doubt. Absolutely. Um, and I think that uh, um, it's, uh, it's a tough road, but you need to do it. And the one point that I did want to get across is that, well, I, one thing I wanted to say, I sinned early. I took Stanley Kaplan early. I took it the first time. I didn't, I didn't wait till the, till the second time. So I took it the first time. And um, part of the thing is you're going to need your family for support. I had decided, I had made a conscious decision that I was not going to be looking to get married until I was almost through with my training. Because to me, it was, in my mind, I knew how much time that I had to spend studying. So it was, to me, it was unfair to the other person because I knew how much commitment there was going to be on my part to medicine. Um, I was asked by the one thought that I'll leave you with is um, my first, it was my first interview at the Indiana School of Medicine. And the candidate asked me at the end, we always asked, are there any questions you have for me? And so he said to me, why do you do this? And I said, why do I do medicine? He said, no, why do you interview? So I thought it was a very interesting question. And so I sat there and I said, you know what? Being in medicine or being in healthcare, as Dr. Jones pointed out at the beginning, is still an extremely noble profession. And I just wanted to make sure that the next generation of physicians in, in healthcare and healthcare providers are as dedicated as I am. And maybe that's a, a, a little bit you know, arrogant, but at the same time, it's true. Because I still, no matter how hard I worked and no matter how much I feel I deserve to be where I'm at, I still consider what I do a privilege. And so I found that out by your essays that you guys had turned in, that you guys feel the same way. And as I said at the beginning, I am very happy to see that we're leaving the next generation of medicine to students like you. So thank you. <laughs>